Thank you very much. It's an unusual pleasure and an honor to introduce the speaker today, uh, John Baez. Personally, he's my, essentially my oldest mathematical friend and, uh, and it has been a tremendous inspiration to me over the years. It's very easy to introduce him, I think, because if I would describe John in one sentence, I would say he's the mathematical incarnation of the universal intellectual. He knows everything, and he's very happy to explain anything to anyone. <laughs> and this is wonderful to have him around. I was just bugging him even before this lecture about quantum field theory. So, uh, in fact, he's such so good at public exposition, it's very easy to forget uh, his prowess as a researcher, which it's very interesting to see that category theory appears in the title today, because he has really made fundamental contributions in category theory and its applications to fundamental physics. So that's uh, been a, quite a, an exciting thing even th th in the course of, of my mathematical career. John's idea uh, formulated about 30 years ago, I think, on the relevance of higher category th for quantum field theory has really revolutionized the area. And now everybody's talking about higher categories in quantum field theory. Um, uh, generalized symmetries, categorical operators, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in, in, in quantum field theory as well as very down-to-earth physics like uh, condensed matter. It seems to be the, I mean, certainly in my mind anyway, is the most important and exciting area of current day theoretical physics. And this really goes back to the fundamental ideas <coughs> that John introduced 30 years ago. And of course, he's trying to apply the same kind of clear thinking and original insight to many other areas of scientific research, one of which we'll hear today. So let's all thank John and uh, welcome him to deliver this lecture. Thanks so much. Yeah, so Min Yang has been asking me penetrating and difficult questions ever since I first met him when I was a postdoc at Yale, and he was a graduate student who started out working on math connected to string theory, but then thought better of it slightly and, and sh shifted towards number theory and worked with uh, Serge Lang on, on number theory, but he's always been blending number theory and physics, uh, so it's fun to keep bumping into you in different locations and continue our conversations. So I've been trying to figure out practical applications of pure mathematics uh, since around 2010, when I became very concerned with climate change and eventually realized that although I was very concerned about climate change, I couldn't stop being a mathematician. I, I, I tried for a while, actually, but it just didn't work. Um, and so then I had to figure out how, what a mathematician can do about problems like climate change. And through an interesting twist of events, it led to work on other problems, uh, such as epidemiology. So that's what I want to talk about mainly today, although I'll get back to climate change at the very end. So <clears throat> there's a modeling tradition called system dynamics, which is invented by an economist at MIT, in which dynamical systems are modeled using diagrams like the one you're looking at here, which are called stock flow diagrams. And now these diagrams are used in a lot of different forms of modeling, uh, in that is, a lot of areas of modeling, like economics, population biology, epidemiology, and so on. So let me tell you what this diagram means. It's not very uh, difficult to understand. So if you know a little math, and just a really little math is required. So there are these things called stocks, which are these boxes. And you think of those, each box is having some number of things in it, which in this case would be people, but it could be anything. And we are going to model those numbers as being just positive real numbers, because we're going to write some differential equations down. Now, you may argue that you can't have 3.92 people, which is probably true, but for these models, we would t typically apply them in situations where you have lots and lots of people and you can get away uh, approximating it with a, with a 
of a positive real number instead of, think of it that way and write down differential equations and ignore the discreteness. So here we have susceptible people, infective people, meaning people who have the disease and can inf infect others, and recovered people. Those are our three stocks. Then there are these double-edged arrows, and those are called flows, and they indicate the possibility that, uh, I'll call them people, but it wouldn't have to be people. People of one kind can flow from one stock to another. So susceptible people can get infected, infective people can recover, recover, and then recovered people can lose their immunity and go back to being susceptible. And when, this, when any flow occurs, the, the number of people in one stock decreases, uh, the, namely the one that the flow is flowing out of, and the number of people in the other stock increases in an exactly compensating way. So there's conservation of people, or conservation of whatever material is flowing along these uh, flows. Then the question is, what, how big are these flows? At what rate are susceptible people becoming infected or infected recovering or recovered people losing their immunity? We need to calculate that those, those flow rates. And so you have to give some formulas for those flow rates to specify a model. For example, this here would be the rate at which people are getting infected. Typically, in a simple model of disease, you would say that that flow rate there of infection is equal to the number of susceptible people, notice that blue arrow pointing from there, times some number. And that number is called the force of infection. So this flow rate is, in this particular case, just the product of these two variables. But in general, it could be any function of those variables. Well, what is this force of infection? Well, you have to calculate that, too. In the typical simple model, it would be the number of contacts per unit time that a per person has, that is, how many people they meet per unit time, times the per contact likelihood of infection when they meet an infected person, times the fraction of infected people uh, sorry, times the fraction of people who are infected. So you multiply those three variables to get the force of infection. How do you calculate the fractional prevalence? Well, that's easy. You just take the number of infected people and divide it by the total population. So this variable depends on these two quantities. How do you calculate the total population? Well, that's easy. You just sum up all three of these stocks, and so on. So we notice there are two types of arrows in this diagram, and they're completely different in nature. There are these flows, which describe how uh, entities or some substance move from one stock to another. And then there are these blue things, which are called links, which represent, in some sense, the flow of information or the flow of computation. That they, they, you use them to describe how you compute some variables from other variables. And not drawn in this picture are the specific functions whereby you calculate the new variables from the other variables. But you should really think of those functions as being part of the whole model. So for example, if I annotated this model, I would tell you in the picture that the force of infection was the, this constant times this times this, or that this was equal to uh, infected divided by total population, and so on. So you should think of little functions attached to those uh, variables. So here's a much simpler example. I'm going to focus on a simpler situation uh, just to keep the distractions to a minimum. So here's a particular case where these flow variables are purely functions of stocks. So there are no intermediate additional variables floating around like this big cloud of variables up here. Because ultimately, everything is computed as functions of the stocks. These intermediate variables are extremely useful when you're doing modeling to keep track of what you're thinking about. But I just want to simplify the math here. So I'm going to have these flows be directly functions of the stocks. And so the boxes are called stocks. These double-edged arrows are called flows. And these blue arrows are links. And links always now, in this simplified version, just point directly from stocks to flows. So that's the structure of the stock flow diagram. Um, but there's a bit more to it. As I said, we have to 
To get an actual model, we need to equip each flow with a function, which I call a flow function. Um, and that function will be a function of, the, of several variables. And those several variables will, be, will correspond to the very various stocks that have links pointing to that flow. So in other words, this, for example, the flow infection will be some function of the number of susceptible people and the number of infected people, because the links are pointing from, from those two stocks. It could be any function in principle. I'm going to call that function phi sub i. Um, and here what I'm starting to do in this set of differential equations is show you the differential equations that the model describes. And I'm starting to conflate two things. There are these letters here, which are just the names of the boxes. And then there will be some functions of time, which are how many people are in the box at that time. So S is, means susceptible, but we also think of there's some function, S of t, saying how many susceptible people there are at time t. And I'm using S in that second sense here and telling you that the time derivative of the number of susceptible people in this model is minus phi i s i of t, with a minus sign because they're flowing out. Notice those susceptible people are coming, becoming infected, so we get the same term showing up here as one of the terms in di dt, but with a positive sign because they're flowing in. And so each double-edged arrow gives two terms in these differential equations, one with a minus sign and one with a positive sign. Um, can you, I didn't tell you what D stands for. What does that stand for? Dead, De dead, yeah, so the dead. So, so people don't go away, they just go live underground in a little tomb with a, uh, a little stone above them in this model here. So you, you, can, you can have there be conservation of people even in this, uh, even, even in models where people die. Yeah, so there's a certain uh, rate at which infected people die, which in this simple model is just some arbitrary function of uh, uh, phi d of i. So, so that's how they work. So I hope that you get the idea here. It's supposed to be a very simple, intuitive idea if you're used to thinking about things flowing from one state to another. And I just want to, I hope that I've brainwashed you into thinking that if I wrote down any diagram of this general type, any bunch of boxes connected with flows and with these blue links, you could just systematically write down the differential equation attached to it with no creativity whatsoever. And, and, the, and I'm the reason why I'm not writing it all out in a whole bunch of formulas uh, is because I think it's more fun to just sort of get the pattern here and believe that there is this pattern. Um, uh, just to quiz you, though, for example, I didn't rule out the possibility of a flow going from a box to itself. I didn't show you an example like that because I was not trying to torture you then, but I'm trying to torture you now. So, you have a, so, so if I have a flow from a box to itself, what, does it, what effect does that have on the differential equations? See, I convinced you that you could handle any case and so now I'm checking to see if that was really true or if it was just that I, I like fooled you into thinking you could handle any case because I didn't show you all the cases. But I claim that if you really just follow the, follow the algorithm, you will, you'll get the answer. Does someone want to venture what, it sh what, it should, what, that, what the effect should be in that case? Zero. It has no effect on the differential equations at all, because if I had a flow going, say, from S to S, it would contribute a term with a minus sign, because it's coming out of S, and the same term with a plus sign, uh, because it's also flowing back into S. So that's why we don't bother drawing those kind of double-edged arrows from th something to itself. But you could if you want, and we'd still know what to do. OK, that was a little qu quiz. OK. So starting from the stock flow models, we can systematically, algorithmically get a set of differential equations. And so um, some modelers, and certainly many mathematicians, would say, well, why don't you just write down the differential equations? Why, don't, why do we do this complicated business 
of drawing all these pictures and then converting them to differential equations. So shockingly, most people find it easier to understand diagrams than differential equations. That is the reason why. Now you might say, well, we don't really care about most people. Uh, we're mathematicians. We care about what we can do. But in fact, modeling is a community enterprise. In fact, there's a whole uh, system now called community-based modeling. And the idea is that the person who knows about differential equations and modeling is not in a position to build the whole model themselves because they're trying to, for example, go into a community where there's some disease spreading and model the disease. And they have to talk to people in the community to find out what are the relevant factors, what, what kind of things affect the transmission of the disease. And so they need to communicate with people with many different forms of expertise to build a model. And most of those people don't know differential equations, or at least would prefer not to think about differential equations. And so you can communicate to them more directly with the diagrams. And then you, the modeler, can convert them into the differential equations. And here's a famous example of that from a book on uh, community-based modeling. So there was a village out in India somewhere where they had a bunch of cows, and the cows were starting to get sick, and there's some disease of cows, and a modeler wanted to help them with their problems and decided to go out there and actually model the, the dynamics of this rather complex system. And so the modeler did that. And down below here, you see a modeler talking with different community members designing this model, which is sh shown up here. If you could stare at this very carefully, which would be hard to see, you would see that the, the, uh, the flow functions aren't yet put in. So, so far, there's a, it's a whole elaborate practice, but the first stage of the practice is to draw the diagram without knowing the, or guessing the flow functions. Uh, but an interesting thing about this way of uh, doing things is that, well, you'll see the village elders here uh, debating this. As often in the case in villages in India, women were excluded from this decision-making process, which is not really a good idea. But you see a woman there, and this woman actually s stared at these diagrams and noticed that they'd left something out, which she's explaining to them here. They left out the fact that the village had a bunch of, was starting to buy some European cows and the European cows needed more water than the cows that the typical Indian, the old, typical village Indian cows needed, and that that was part of the problem here. And so she was able to explain that to these other folks uh, and fix the model. And so that's the type of thing that actually should be solicited and encouraged in community-based modeling is that you take your model and you talk to lots of people and explain it to them, and they'll all have different points of view and contribute to the building of the model, which you cannot do by showing bunches of differential equations to people. It just doesn't work. So sociologists have a name for this concept. They call it, they say these diagrams are boundary objects. Now, to a mathematician, especially a category theorist, the concept of boundary object sounds very exciting and alluring, but it needs something different than that than you might think uh, in sociology. So, but it's a nice concept nonetheless. A boundary object is any object that's part of multiple different social worlds and facilitates communication between them. It has a different identity in each social world that it inhabits. So the diagram means something different to the people uh, in the village and the modeler. And also, it means something different to me, the category theorist. But we can all talk by means of pointing at the diagrams without having to agree on everything about what the diagrams mean. Now, there's a community of epidemiologists who use stock flow to uh, model the spread of disease. And this includes my collaborators on this project, uh, Nate Osgood and Xiaoyan Li, who were really big in organizing COVID modeling for the government of Canada recently. And they told the rest of our team a bunch about how modeling is actually done in, in these health issues. A lot of it's done using some commercial software called AnyLogic, which is quite powerful in some ways, but it has some big problems. First of all, 
it doesn't let you compose models. You can't have several different people build models, different stock flow diagrams, and then subsequently enter them all into the same space, so to speak, and glue them together. And thus, it makes it very hard to collaboratively build models, which is what community-based modeling should encourage, in fact. And it's not free, and it's not open source. So we're trying to fix all that. So to see why it's so important to be able to compose models, this is the actual model that was used by Nate and Xiaoyan uh, for modeling COVID for the government of Canada. And the main thing you'll notice is that you, there's so much stuff going on in this picture that you can't even see it. I could zoom in, of course, and then you'd see a bit of it. But the point is that all of this junk has to be entered into a single page on any logic. You cannot say, oh, you, the director of such and such hospital, you make your model of what's going on in your hospital and then send it over to me and I'll just pop it into my model. I would have to retype it into my model. So it's a mess, in short. They did pretty well, but it's, they realized that this is just a bad setup. So what we're trying to do is come up with a compositional approach to modeling, and we're going to use an idea that goes back to the category theorist Bill Levere's uh, thesis, and this idea is called functorial semantics. Now, functorial semantics is pretty flexible, and his use of it was different than various other later uses of it. For example, in many applications to computer science, there's some kind of use of it that works roughly like this, very simplified version. You have a category where the objects are different data types, like you know, real number, floating point, blah, blah, blah. And morphisms are programs. So if a program goes from some data type to another data type, and you can compose programs by feeding the output of one into the input of the next. And the fact that I call it C does not mean I'm using the language C. <laughs> Uh, there's a category D whose objects are sets and whose morphisms are, let's say, partially defined functions. So that's just very familiar to mathematicians. We need partially defined functions because some programs will never halt and they won't compute a function. Then the key part is that there's a functor from the first category to the second one. So it sends each data type to a set, namely the set of possible data of that type. Like if you're data type is real, then it would get sent to the actual set of real numbers. And it sends each program to the function, or partial function, that the program is supposed to commute, compute. And the fact that it's a functor means that you can compose programs and then convert it to a function, and that's the same thing as converting each of those programs to a function and then compose and get a new function. So we say that this functor maps syntax, that is descriptions of things, like programs, to semantics, that is, meanings of those programs, like the functions they actually compute. So this is a powerful way to think about the relationship between syntax, things you write or draw, and semantics, namely what those things mean. So now in our approach, the functorial semantics is working a little bit differently. For us, the category will have morphisms which are models and composing those morphisms means sticking together two models to form a bigger model. I'll explain this in more detail, but that's the basic idea. And then there's, sorry, this, that shouldn't say functor. There's a category D where morphisms are bunches of differential equations. Now, you may never have thought about a category where the morphisms are differential equations because you may never have thought about composing differential equations, but that's what I'll have to explain. And then there's a functor from C to D. So it will send the model, for example, one of these stock flow diagrams, to the collection of differential equations that it describes. And it preserves composition. If it's a, if it's a functor, that's got to be what it does. So let me say how it works. So I told you what a stock flow diagram is, but in a more mathematical way, it's, 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 it's this. It's a set of flows, sorry, my pointer is not. It's a set of flows, a set of stocks, and a set of links. Every link has a source, which is a stock, like this blue link starts here, and it has a target, which is a flow. So 
Um, and then also, so those are the blue arrows are the links, so everyone has a source and a target. And then also, in addition, the flows are a different kind of arrow. And the jargon is each flow has an upstream and a downstream stock. So this flow here goes from the upstream stock S to the downstream stock I. So that's the, that covers the pictorial part of the stock flow diagram. But then there are these flow functions, namely for each flow, you have a flow function from R to something to R. And that something is the set of all links whose target is that flow. So in addition to the diagram itself, you have these, in this case here, we'd have these three different flow functions that would let you calculate the flows. So that's a stock flow diagram in a slightly more formal definition. Um, sorry. Ah. Sorry, I seem to be in a time reversed mode here. Ah. <laughs> I think maybe I'm back into this shit. Here I'm back. Okay, but I said that these models are morphisms and you can compose them. So how the heck could you compose such things? Well, we actually need to make them open. An open stock flow diagram is a stock flow diagram together with functions from two finite sets, A and B, for example, into the set of stocks of our stock flow diagram. We will use those sets A and B to, as kind of ports or loose ends that we can use to compose stock flow diagrams. So I'll call this a stock, open stock flow diagram going from A to B, and I'll write it as a kind of, sorry, I'll write it as a kind of morphism. Um, and we can compose them. We compose them by gluing them along one of these finite sets B. So let me just show you how that works. So here I have uh, one called F, which is I've talked about before. Here I've got one called G, and here's their composite. G is a little stock flow diagram that just has a single flow going from R to S called loss of resistance. A resistant person can become susceptible again. This stock flow model didn't have anything going from R to S. When we compose them, we do it by gluing the stocks pointed to from the numbers three and four here to the stocks pointed to from the numbers three and four going here, and we just glue in that little extra flow. But you could glue together big complicated stock flow models as well. So this is a composition operation. So you work, you get a category, which I'll call open stock flow, that has finite sets as objects and open stock flow diagrams as morphisms. So that's our syntax. That's the stuff that you draw on the paper. And then what does it mean? What's the semantics? Well, that's what comes next. We're going to construct another category, open dynam, of open dynamical systems and a functor from open stock flow to open dynam that will extract the differential equation from the stock flow diagram. So I've already told you how to turn a stock flow diagram into a collection of differential equations, but how does it work with this open stock flow diagrams? Well, it's the same basic, same basic idea. Sorry. <laughs> um, but let me just be a little more precise now. So, a dynamical system is just another name for a vector field. Uh, so I'll say a dynamical system on some finite set of variables is a vector field on R to that set. Uh, and you use that vector field to write down a system of first order ODE. So this would be the kind of ODE you'd get from this model that I keep showing you over and over again as an example. And this is sort of long and clunky looking, so we might just abbreviate it this way here. Um, so an open dynamical system is a dynamical system on some finite set X together with maps from two finite sets into that set X. So here's a picture of an open dynamical system. We have the set X, and then we have maps from A and B into X, and then crucially the, the interesting part is that we have a vector field on R to the X. Over here, I'm writing the differential equation that comes from that vector field. So it's, 
It's a first set of first order ODE, which would and we'd use them, of course, to describe the, how the number of susceptible, infected, dead, and resistant people change with time. So, so it turns out that just as I constructed a category of uh, open stock flow diagrams, we can construct a category of open dynamical systems, again with finite sets as objects, and then the difference is that now we have open dynamical systems as the morphisms. And the, yeah? Very little. Um, so the only, only relationship there is that we have functions from the sets A and B into the set of variables. You can think of this as a set of variables in your differential equations. And so the, the, the reason why we do this is we will want to compose dynamical systems. And what we're doing when we're doing that is we are, we have two sets of differential equations and we lump them into one set of differential equations by identifying some variables in one with some in the other. So people in physics and everywhere tend to do this intuitively without even thinking about it, where you have some differential equations describing something, some differential equations describing something else, and you say, hey, there's some variable showing up in both set of differential equations. I can create a new set of differential equations in which that variable is shared to both. So it's, it's not, nothing very profound. It's, it's just what we do, but we're just trying to formalize it here so that we can turn it into software. So, so then you get this functor that turns open stock flow diagrams to open dynamical systems. So for example, if we had this open stock flow diagram that I keep showing you over and over again, you'd get that open dynamical system. We just basically say, don't worry about the, the flows and the links, just tell me the differential equations. The open stock flow diagram has within it the flow functions, which I should have listed over here. That, that was part of the data. They didn't appear out of thin air down below. They were, they were, in, they were, they were, they were in there from the start. Um, so what does it mean to say this thing is a functor? Well, the main thing is a functor has to preserve composition. So it means that you can stick together some models and then convert them into differential equations or convert them into differential equations and then stick together the, the differential equations by identifying variables, and those are the same thing. Okay, so that was sort of the math part that, that, that I was responsible for. And then the hard part is actually to build a useful system based on these ideas. And luckily, um, Evan Patterson and Sophie Libkind at the Topos Institute, an institute in, in Berkeley, uh, are experts on using categories in computation, and together with them, we built software that, that implements this. And we built this software in a system called Algebraic Julia. So Julia is a language for high-performance scientific computing, like solving big bunches of differential equations, but Algebraic Julia is a kind of package within Julia that was developed by James Fairbanks here and Evan and Sophie and many other people, which is basically a package that introduces category theoretic constructs. So you can define a category in, in Algebraic Julia, and you, you define an operad in Algebraic Julia. All sorts of mathematical constructs, like all the ones I've been using and more, are, are in there, and so you can actually work with them explicitly. So it's not like you have the category theory ideas in your head, and then you type it all in C, and, and you just know that your code was inspired by the category theory, you actually type the ideas into Algebraic Julia in the language of category theory. They had already done composition of dynamical systems in this framework by the time we came along. So we created a software package called Stockflow, which you can get on GitHub, and it lets you build Stockflow diagrams, view them, make them open by getting these maps from these sets I was calling A and B into them, apply various functors to them. The one I've talked about to you today is turning them into differential equations, but others as well. And then, of course, solve the differential equations where the power of Julia comes in. And I should say there's a lot of stuff that I'm not getting into, but, for example, one, of, one thing is that in addition to just being able to compose 
stock flow diagram sort of end to end, the way you compose morphisms in a category, we could compose them in more complicated patterns, like here are three stock flow diagrams, uh, all three of which share this stock E, for example. So you'd like to stick them all together and identify all these three E stocks together, and these two R's, and these two I's, and these two S's. So that turns out to be possible to do, not in an arbitrary category, but in a certain class of categories called hypergraph categories, where you can use operations in a certain operad, it's called, to glom together morphisms in these more complex patterns. And that's very useful for, for, for practice, because that's what you want to be able to do. You want to have a lot of freedom in how you build models out of smaller parts. And, and we can do a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> so, so the next stage was that uh, Nate Osgood and his student Eric Redekop uh, made a graphical user interface for stock flow. So it's called Model Collab. And it's also available on GitHub. We wrote a paper about it which explains it more in the language suitable for people who don't know category theory, uh, minimizing the, the technical details. And so the point is that this software can run in a web browser, and, and it can the same uh, instance of the software can run in multiple web browsers simultaneously. So for example, two people could be building a, a stock flow diagram in remote locations, or you could build part of a, you could build a, a stock flow diagram and then save it, and then someone else could open it up later and move it into another stock flow diagram and compose it to form a bigger one, or other things like that. Um, so here, the interaction that you have with the stock flow diagrams is purely graphical. So you, you can click on the menu at left and create stocks. You can move them around with your mouse. You can connect them up with flows with your mouse, and so on. So the point is that we are reaching the ideal stage of category theory, which is that you can use it without knowing anything about category theory. Um, so it's back in the background uh, running, running in the algebraic Julia software, but you don't need to know that. It looks quite simple and self-evident that you're just moving, making these models. And then you can click and say, OK, solve the differential equations. You have to input initial conditions, of course. And you don't need to know about algebraic Julia either. So that, that's sort of the, the goal here, is to build a, a, a system that seems very simple and natural. But that's what category theory is actually always trying to do. It's trying to find out what's simple and natural so that you can do that. So what's next? Um, I think I'm going much faster than I needed to, but that's, you'll, no one's going to ever complain if a talk, talk ends too soon, I guess. Um, so we're doing various things. So, uh, so Min Young Kim is the director of the International Center of Mathematical Sciences, fairly close to here in the Bayes Center. And he instituted this program called Mathematics for Humanity, which is basically three allied programs to fund work on mathematics that's beneficial directly to humanity in various ways. One of those programs is called Mathematical Challenges for Humanity, which covers a host of issues. For example, uh, epidemiology would fit in there, or climate change would fit in there. And he also has one on uh, the history of mathematics towards a global search for a, a gl more global approach to the history of mathematics. And another one is uh, improving mathematics education and collaborations in, in countries in the global south, approximately. He could describe it more accurately than me. Um, but uh, as part of that program, Nate Xiaoyan and Evan, and two other folks, Chris Brown, a programmer from Topos, and Sean Wu at the pharmaceutical firm Merck, and I are going to spend six weeks here in Edinburgh to extend this work that I've described to a different style of modeling. So there's a very important style of modeling called agent-based models. So you see, the models that I've described so far have people described in stocks. So you like you imagine I have a big vat 
of, of people who have some particular properties rather than treating them as individuals. But in an agent-based model, you simulate individuals. And the reason why you do that is not just because it sounds more polite to treat people as individuals than en masse, but when, when you're dealing with situations where the, in where the people can have multiple different characteristics, it becomes unwieldy and almost impossible to have a separate stock for all the different possible characteristics that a person could have. So I was joking that you would never do like a stock flow model where one stock would be like 62-year-old math professors who are in Edinburgh giving a lecture on differential equations. But in an agent-based model, you could, you, people could have all sorts of characteristics, and that would be one possible characteristic that, a, that an agent could have. And, and agent-based models are, are becoming very popular in, the, in health uh, modeling because you want to track people's motion, the way that they could infect each other, and so on, in, in a very fine-grained manner. So that's what we're working on now. And just uh, recently, we've allied with Patricia Mabry at this research institute called the Health Partners Institute for Education and Research in the US. And she's an expert on uh, human behavior modeling for health problems connected to substance abuse, especially tobacco addiction, but also other forms of drug abuse. And people are beginning to want to use better agent-based models of, of uh, substance abuse and addiction to figure out what are the best interventions that can be used, the most effective interventions that can be used to reduce substance abuse. Uh, roughly what happened was that the, uh, there were these lawsuits against tobacco companies in the United States which won lots of money from the tobacco companies and went to the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, because the FDA uh, acquired, sometime around 2009, I could have the year quite a bit off, they acquired the power to regulate tobacco as a drug in the United States, whereas before it had managed to escape regulation as a drug due to the power of the tobacco companies. And so all of a sudden, the Federal Drug Administration Food and Drug Administration had the ability to regulate tobacco and a lot of money to go ahead and start doing it, but they, they don't do their own uh, research. So they didn't know what to do, what would be the effective ways to reduce uh, tobacco addiction. And so they have been contracting out, so to speak, to the National Institute of Health, which does uh, research, to try to understand the mechanisms of, of tobacco addiction. Uh, and, and there's been much more interested in, in that due to the rise of vaping. And so the new, new ways of, that tobacco companies have come up with to get kids addicted to tobacco. And, and so there's been a lot of work at the National Institute of Health to try to understand the behavioral patterns of people that lead them to become addicted or lead them to escape tobacco addiction or lead them to fall back into it and so on. A lot of which involves social contact with other people. So you know, one main way you start smoking is if you quit, but then you, a friend of yours walks up to you and offers you a cigarette. So that's the type of thing that they're trying to understand. But they don't, and they've come up with some theories about how this works in quite, de quite a bit of detail, but they haven't done uh, as much uh, agent-based modeling of, of these problems as they want to. So we're going to start working on that. So that's sort of the story of where this epidemiological work goes. And I'm really excited about the use of, of pretty modern mathematical techniques to help design software for this modeling. And part of why I'm interested in it is it gives a new avenue for mathematicians to become involved in practical issues. Um, Category theorists had tended to be labeled as being the purest of the pure in mathematics. That started breaking down already in the 1980s when it started getting applied to uh, first to quantum field theory, then to condensed matter physics and, and quantum computation. Actually, even before then to con traditional computer science, but maybe mathematicians weren't so aware of that. Uh, 
But I think that category theory, by being virtue of a, being a very general, flexible language for describing systems, interacts really well with computer programming, where you're able to take your insights in how systems could or should behave and write software that actually does behave that way. And in particular with this, these newer languages where you can actually write programs using category theoretic concepts, it lets you, it lets you achieve new kinds of effects that you wouldn't have been able to think of otherwise if you're just writing code sort of directly without any assistance from, from higher powered concepts. Um, so there's another th thing I want to mention. So I mentioned that uh, I got into this whole business due to my worries about climate change, and my worries have only increased as the years have gone by because of the way things are, are going. Um, so I was pleased, but I admit also a little surprised, but very happy when Nate Osgood and I got called in to lead a program at the Fields Institute in Toronto. It's a, it's a institute not completely unlike the ICMS here in Edinburgh that has a lot of mathematics meetings and workshops. And the idea is that they, uh, the Fields Institute you know, typically has lots of people visiting and having workshops, and that was sort of got in deep trouble during COVID uh, when, when all of a sudden people weren't supposed to be meeting in large groups. And so instead of just saying, well, we'll meet on Zoom now, they actually went a little f further than that, and they started a program on epidemiology, the mathematics of epidemiology. Uh, so Nate Osgood got pulled into that. And um, so now the director of the Fields Institute, Kumar Murthy, has decided that that worked well enough that they would like to try to get mathematicians pulled into working on climate change. And, and so that's what we're going to try to do. And an interesting thing that we, is that Kumar Murthy agrees with me about an, an important aspect of this program, which is that it shouldn't mainly be about the geophysics of climate change, that is climate modeling, uh, but instead it should focus on uh, what we should do about climate change. So basically there are, while it's always better to improve models of the climate, we already have enough understanding of the climate to realize that there's a lot of stuff we should be doing that we're doing much too slowly and inefficiently. Uh, and so that's the real uh, stumbling block right now. And so I've encountered uh, in many talks of mine when I talk about climate change that there are a lot of mathematicians, particularly younger mathematicians, who want to get involved in doing something about climate change, but they don't know what. In certain areas of mathematics, it's sort of easy to tell what to do. So, I mean, if you're studying Navier-Stokes equations, then it's pretty sensible for you to start studying uh, weather, weather patterns or, or the oceans. But if you're a category theorist or this or that, you may feel this... Uh, and a lot of people do feel this sense of frustration that, that they, they don't really know how they can help. And, and so what I'm hoping is that we could form working groups where mathematicians of different kinds can work with experts on practical problems connected to the human response to climate change and, 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 and get pulled into uh, helping on these problems. So here, here's a list of some of these subjects. So these are different mathematical subjects that have theorems in them and have, have a lot of open questions and open problems in them. But they are also subjects where people trying to deal with climate change uh, are, are, are using, using these methodologies and feel the need for improving these methodologies. And I'm optimistic about the ability of mathematicians to get pulled into doing practical things by working with experts on those specific various practical areas because of my own experience. I spend a bunch of time sort of blundering around on my own trying to figure out how I could do something with my mathematics that could help uh, climate change or help the world, you could say. Uh, and it all completely changed when I got hooked up with, with Nate Osgood and various other epidemiologists and various programmers who are sort of a, who knew what they wanted to do and, and knew an, just enough math to ask me questions and tell me things uh, 
so that we could start working on a project together. And then all of a sudden, it became much more imaginable how I could do something practical, whereas before it seemed sort of impossible, almost impossible. Somehow, mathematicians have a, suffer from a little bit of, pure mathematicians, I think, suffer from a bit of learned helplessness. I guess that's the jargon for it. You say, like, I'm really smart, but all I know how to do is study Adele's or Piatic integration theory. You know, I, I can't. I can't fight climate change. Um, but I, I, think, I, don't, I, don't, I think that learned helplessness can be unlearned through work with, with experts. Um, so anyway, I'm hoping that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Um, I, think, I think I'm not saying too much to say that Minyang wants the ICMS to get involved in this project. And I'm hoping other mathematics institutes will get involved in this thing. And, <laughs> And from what I know about the uh, predictions of the Earth's climate, you'll see, I think, if you live long enough, that this is going to become an increasingly urgent uh, problem so that by 2050 or 2070, we'll, we'll wonder why we didn't start in really drastic uh, programs on, on fighting climate change in all possible ways. So it's better to get going now. OK, thanks. Thanks very much. We've got uh, just under 10 minutes for questions, if people have questions in the room or on Zoom. Um, both people in the room and on Zoom, please be aware that the talk is being recorded. So if you don't want to appear in a recording or have your voice appear in a, uh, your voice heard in a recording, then um, you might want to just speak to John separately. Yeah, I can talk afterwards if you, if <laughs> you Any want. questions? Um, and please wait for the microphone so that it picked up for people joining online. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, a very interesting talk. Um, it might be um, covered in what you're planning to do with agent-based modeling, but I wondered um, to what extent does this approach enable you to um, construct stochastic versions of these kind of models? So rather right. than having right. uh, flows, what you might be specifying is the probability distribution for sojourns. Because it seems to right. you know, the, the, the basic stock flow diagram is kind of the starting point for both formulations. That's right. So one of the, one of the interesting thing about the widely used agent-based models is they actually combine deterministic and stochastic uh, behavior. And I've been thinking about that a lot lately. And I just realized, in fact, something that probably should have been obvious for a long time, that almost the same mathematics as, as in the stock flow diagrams can be applied to, the, to a large class of agent-based models. Sorry, I was just trying to click on a, on a figure, but I, you know, I can just wave my hand. So just imagine one of those stock flow models I, <laughs> I showed. So whereas instead of, instead of thinking of a certain number of people in each stock, the simplest thing would be you just have a single agent who is in one or the other of these states, or we name them states. And instead of differential equations describing the flow of these uh, of stocks, we um, want a we want to specify stochastic rules for it from hopping from one state to another. And they have an interesting way of doing that, which was a little confusing to me at first. So I was very used to Markov processes, where you would just specify like a transition probability per time along each edge that I'm calling a flow. But that's not good enough for, for the kind of models that they want. So what they will often have in the modeling software, this any logic software, is have an edge labeled by basically a something that's equivalent to a hazard function of t as a function of time. So basically, that tells you how likely it is for you to hop from one state to another as a function of time. So it could be, for example, that you sit in this state and after five seconds go by, you definitely hop to the next state. So that's like a very special case of a probabilistic process where it's completely certain. But it could be after a certain time delay. Or you could have 
this kind of thing where you're like hopping from here to here with a certain constant probability per unit time, and then that would just give you this kind of exponential decay of the amount of being here. But all sorts of other functions, and those functions can depend on what's going on in other, in other states. So I think the, the, the diagrammatic structure of these uh, state charts, they're called, you can make it look diagrammatically just like these stock flow models, but, but the difference is the data you're assigning to the flows is not a, a flow function, but one of these uh, hazard functions as a function of other variables, which could be connected to it by links. And of course, this, the, the, uh, the, the, the semantics, the interpretation of this diagram to give you a set of, of to describe the dynamics would be quite different, because now it would be a stochastic process. But luckily, the nice thing is that in the category theory, the, the, those, the differences are in some sense not as big as the commonalities. That is, a whole bunch of the, of the structure can be reused. And also, we'd like to be able to combine stock flow models with state charts, too. And so that, that's nice that they have that structural commonality. Do you work on such things? Um, mainly it's individual based stochastic models. Um, okay. Um, often where you've got spatially distributed populations, so in a sense, every individual has its own location. So uh, that, I guess that would fit into your agent based framework. Yeah. Right. So we can, in space is incredibly important in a lot of models, and to a first approximation, you can just uh, treat it as like some, a some aspect of the state of the agent, but it plays some privileged roles, of course, because it limits like what kind of behavior, what kind of interactions can occur between agents. If you have multiple agents, they have to be close to each other often for like to catch a disease or something like that. So yeah, we have to think harder about that. Great. Any more questions in the room? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, sure. I hope I, sorry, I hope this question doesn't get too long, but I'm, I'm a little bit thinking about actually analogy with your previous work that I mentioned <laughs> in TQFT. Uh -huh. Because uh, in my mind, the real power of TQFT is the fact that, you, and, I mean, everybody thought about taking a manifold and breaking out into pieces, right? But in TQFT, you view the manifold as a morphism and break it up into a composition of morphism, and that turns out to be enormously useful, right? Right. So can you use such ideas here? You take an enormously large stock, stock diagram, is that, I forgot that. Stock flow diagram. Stock flow diagram, and you think about ways of breaking them up using a categorical perspective into small morphisms in some way. So. Basic morphisms. Yeah. Say. So certainly the whole, mathematical structure I'm using here is sort of based on what I learned about TQFT. So it's not at all any, any coincidence. Um, there's some differences, which is that in topological quantum field theory, you can sort of solve for what a particular little chunk of space-time will do. And then, <laughs> sorry, OK, for some reason, it's a completely useless picture, but it's just like, it's what everyone always draws when they start talking about topological quantum field theory. So if you've been to talk some about that subject, you don't need to see the picture again. But like, when I talk about like a chunk of space time, it might be like a two dimensional space time where two space, chunks of space that look like circles join and fuse to a single one. So this would be thought of as a morphism and you could compose it with another morphism, for example. And, but the nice thing about topological quantum field theory is that you can get an analytical, you use functorial semantics, so you map each of these morphisms to some linear operator from some Hilbert space to some other Hilbert space. But the thing is that so powerful in some ways is that you can, is that you can, uh, analytically describe this linear operator, you can come up with a formula for it. Uh, and then you can show that like in this dimension, you can chop up any two-dimensional manifold into a very limited collection of pieces, most of, of which this is the most exciting one. 
So when you're dealing with uh, things like stock flow diagrams and other systems like electrical circuits that I've studied, the, the, it is easy to describe how you can glue together some sets of differential equations to get a larger set of differential equations, but that does not always or typically make it easy to describe the solutions of the large set of differential equations in terms of the solutions to the smaller pieces. Um, and so it's, it's, it's less, people keep dreaming that you could like learn a lot about a big complicated system behavior by learning, understanding the behavior of all, all the pieces. But, but we know that when you have uh, feedback mechanisms of various sorts and, and, and non-linearity, there's not going to be like any quick and easy way to solve a large complicated set of differential equations from knowing solutions of each of those subsets of equations. So, so basically, we're not even trying to do that now. Now, you might be smart and f like figure out some things that you could extract about the behavior of a, of a big complicated system from things you know about the, about the individual pieces. There's better chance of doing it when you're studying steady state solutions. Um, so like if you have like a, a stretched drum head, you could think of that as being made up of tiny little pieces each of which is a minimal area surface, right? And so, so somehow you, you can figure out what the whole drum head will do by knowing what each little piece will do, at least if each little piece knows what its boundary conditions are. Uh, that's a, so like for elliptic partial differential equations like that, you have, there's some kind of things you can do. But, for, but we don't know any such tricks yet. So for us, it's mainly the, the, the main payoff is that it's very useful to build models a piece at a time. And the project of building a model turns out to be a highly social activity so that it's very useful to, to do it piece by piece in a way where different people are in charge of the different pieces, namely the part of the world that they know about. Yeah, thank you. I mean, just one comment. It, in sure. reality, as you know very well, no, it's not really easy to compute these in TQFT either, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not easy to compute them, but 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 people try and they sometimes succeed. Yeah.